This world of ups and downs, situations spin me round and round. Am I gonna make it? Some say maybe. Only reason I feel secure, I'm keeping my heart on things up above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, and He reminds me that. Christ in Goose Creek, South Carolina. We are certainly appreciative of your viewership even at this particular hour. We want to ask that you grab your copy of God's divine word as we examine and search the scriptures to see if such things are so. Uh, Peter lets us know in 1 Peter 4 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And so we want to hear from heaven those things that God would have us to know in his engrafted word. And so in the book of Ephesians, we want to look in particular, uh, chapter number one, verse seven through verse number 12. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven through verse number 12. Listen to your Bible. The Bible says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him, we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Let all those who believe and agree, wherever you may be, say amen to the reading of the word. Uh, before we examine this particular uh, powerful passage of scripture, I think it's important that we connect with the subject that I have been assigned, uh, entitled, Christ Purchased Man's Salvation. Listen to it one more again. Christ Purchased Man's Salvation. If a man or woman desires to be saved, he or she must have a healthy appreciation for what it means to be purchased. By definition, the acquisition of something for payment is what it means to purchase. Jesus lets us know in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 26, Jesus said, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. And so from this particular text, Matthew 16 and 26, we discover at least two things. Number one, the soul is more value than all this world. And number two, man needs a currency of value that's greater than this material world which belongs to God in the first place. This world is not ours. The Bible lets us know, David lets us know in the 24th division of the psalm and Verse number one, David said, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Amen. We are living in a world that God have created. 
It has been corrupted by sin. Nevertheless, this world belongs to the Lord. But regarding currency that we are discussing, the soul of the man cannot be purchased with the European Union's euro. It cannot be purchased with Switzerland's franc. It could not be purchased with South Koreans' won. It cannot be purchased with Japan's yen, and it can sure enough not be purchased with America's dollar. And so Peter lets us know in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, he lets us know that the Christian was not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus the Christ. When we look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 10, uh, the Bible lets us know that life uh, is shown up in the blood and that it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. I want us to understand that it's not any kind of blood that's going to be able to make atonement for the soul, but only the sinless blood of the Savior for the souls of mankind. In other words, it's important for us to understand and connect with the fact that salvation did not come cheaply. Jesus back, Jesus front, Jesus entire body had to be split open. His flesh had to be broken by suffering in order to pour out the precious purchase price for sin to make uh, to bring about man's salvation. And so even before the crucifixion on Calvary. Jesus' sinless body was savagely beaten with a Roman scourge instrument called a flagrum. And this instrument had leather thongs with pieces of metal, bone, and, or, or hooks on the ends which were uh, designed uh, to cause deep lacerations. Lacerations that would tear the flesh creating excessive bleeding as his muscles became exposed, leaving most prisoners half dead before the crucifixion. The apostle, or, or rather the prophet Isaiah lets us know in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 5, Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we were healed. I want us to understand that salvation is in Christ. When we look in our scriptural text in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7, the Bible lets us know in him we have redemption. And those who are in Christ are uh, in a safe relationship. Those that are in Christ are in the church. The one which he purchased with his own blood according to Acts 20 and verse number 28. Uh, that which is purchased, it's important for us to understand, becomes the property of another. It is that which is owned. For instance, I own my car. For instance, I own my clothes, my raiment. I, I own furniture in my home. But the question of significance becomes, who owns me? You see, it's not so much important what a person owns, but it's more important, significant, uh, as it relates to who owns that person. For the Christian, we've been bought, according to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 20, with a price. And that price came by the shedding of the precious blood of Jesus the Christ. And, and this is why I'm so glad that I'm a member of the body of Christ, the church of Christ. In Romans 16 and verse number 16, the Bible says, greet or salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet or salute you. I want us to understand that the of in church of Christ means something. It literally means into the possession or belonging to church of Christ. The true Christian, it's important that we understand, belongs to or is into the possession of Christ. Having been delivered, the Bible lets us know, from the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of his love, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13. And so the Apostle Paul uh, outlines for us in this particular epistle 
the role of redemption or the saving of man by the triune God, which is to say God the Father, uh, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's important that our viewers understand that we serve a three-in-one God. Listen to your Bible. 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 7. Listen to your Bible. The Bible says these words. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. It's important that we understand that when he makes reference to the Word, who the Word really is. John lets us know in John chapter number 1 and verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And John 1 down to verse number 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace uh, and truth. And, and so in Ephesians chapter number one, specifically three through verse number six, it is the father, God, the father who blessed the child of God with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It is the Father who chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. It is the Father who predestined and adopted us as sons according to his good pleasure. When we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 12, it is the Son who redeemed the child of God by the purchase price of his own blood. In verse number 13 of Ephesians chapter number 1, it is the Holy Spirit uh, by whom the child of God is sealed and is our guarantee to the praise of his glory. And, and so we discover that the entire Godhead is invested in our salvation. Back in 1970, that musical genius and Grammy-winning winning artist uh, by the name of Stevie Wonder had a hit song uh, entitled, Signed, Sealed, and Delivered. And he had a chorus that said, here I am, baby. Uh, signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. I want us to understand that unless one is signed by the Father through the Son, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and delivered by the Son, he or she are still in their sins and under the bondage of Satan. And so Paul very clearly and succinctly declares for the saints who lived in Ephesus the benefits and the blessings that we have in King Jesus. Number one, and in particular, the emphasis of the text talks about redemption. Redemption is a word of uh, good news, particularly uh, for those uh, who understand redemption in the first century that were living in a world of slavery. There were at that time at least 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Slavery was the foundation of this ancient society. And so redemption literally means the purchase out of the slave market and set free. To purchase out of the slave market and set free. A man or a, a man in uh, this day, uh, a man could uh, purchase a, a slave and keep him a slave. But in Christ Jesus, he purchases the child of God with his own blood at a great cost only to set us free to glorify him forever. Oh, isn't that good news? In Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 12, the Bible lets us know with his own blood, he that is Christ entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal, rede not temporary, but eternal Redemption. That's good news. Amen. You missed your shout. The problem we see today is that many do not see themselves as in bondage in the first place and thereby needing to be set free. When you examine John chapter number 8, verse 32 through verse number 36, uh, listen to Jesus. Jesus uh, is contending with the Jews at that day and they were having this great debate. And Jesus says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. 
The Jews responded to Jesus, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? To which Jesus responds, Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, Watch it, you are free uh, indeed. And so, like today, uh, the Jewish nation was blinded to the reality of the destructive nature of sin. Paul lets us know in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, Paul lets us know that the wages of sin is death, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. When we look at uh, verse number 16 through 18, when we back up in that same Romans chapter number 6, verse 16 to 18, uh, listen to Paul. Paul's got a question for the saints to whom he has written this particular epistle, the epistle to the saints in Rome. Paul says, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness, Paul says, but God be thanked that though you were uh, slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine and having been set free, amen, to which you were delivered and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And so people today, amen, and you'll attest to this, people today think that uh, because they're doing their own thing, they are already free. And that's indicative of the deceitful nature of sin. People think that because they're an adult and can do what they want to do uh, within the confines of the legal laws of a particular land, that they are free. But Peter would have us to know over in 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse uh, 3 through 5, Peter says, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. In biblical days, if you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. Uh, and so Peter is metaphorically speaking in reference to those in the world. And so he lets us know when we walk in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regards to these, Peter says, they think it's strange that you do not run uh, with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you, Peter says they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. I stopped by to let you know that Jesus is ready to judge the living and the dead. The question is, are you ready to be judged by God? In 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 9, the redemption, of course, is uh, the byproduct, the byproduct rather of redemption is forgiveness. Uh, Christ bears and removes the burden of our sins. And so we have to understand we don't just keep on sinning like nothing happened. But again, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9, John says, if we confess our sins, uh, amen, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, talking to the child of God. Even after an individual is in a safe relationship, we still stumble and fall at, at times in this life. But if we confess our sins, Paul, uh, John says, he is, Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. David gives us the same similar notion in the 30, 30, uh, 32nd division of the Psalm, Verse number three and verse number five. Listen to how David puts it. David says, when I kept silent, David says, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We've got to come to term with the fact that we have done wrong. In Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23, uh, amen, the Bible lets us know that all have sinned and fallen short 
of the glory of God. You see, I don't understand how an individual can live in this life. A amen, amen, uh, amen, uh, and, and bear the weight of uh, guilt for their wrongdoing. How do you walk around? Uh, amen, understanding that you've done wrong and one day you're going to have to give an account. How do you bear that load? In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 8, as we matriculate down in our particular text, you have to understand that in Christ God makes his wisdom and his prudence abound toward us, the child of God. And so from God, we learn better so that we can do better. Why Solomon comes along in Proverbs chapter number 2 and verse number 6, and Solomon says, the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. You see, from the word of God, we learn that I need to forgive others. From the word of God, we learn how to love others. From the word of God, we learn that we got to be concerned about others because it's from the Lord that we gain wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Paul declares that God's word has made known to us the mystery of his will in verse number nine of our scriptural text. This mystery or hidden truth uh, involved God's plan to save man by including everybody in the same body. The everybody that uh, Paul is talking about, which we're going to take a look at, uh, refers to those, the population of the saved. And so everybody who is saved, God would have in the same body. Listen to Ephesians chapter number three and verse number three through six when we talk about the mystery of the will of God. Paul says how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And what's the mystery? That the Gentiles, or those in the world, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And so we have to understand this is why denominationalism is unbiblical. Denominationalism, our, our branch of Christ and our branch of Christ. Christ didn't have any branches of Christ. You were either connected to the vine or, or you were not. A amen. And so denominationalism, according to Ephesians 4, uh, verse 4 through 5, uh, promotes many bodies. But the Bible still says, the Bible still says, Ephesians 4, 4 through 5, here it comes. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Denominationalism promotes many gospels, many ways to be saved. But the apostle Paul still says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 through 7, Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Denominationalism is rooted in unbiblical teaching, which will one day be uprooted. Listen to Jesus in Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 13. Jesus says, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Not only that, but denominationalism puts man and not Christ as the founder and head of the church. This is unbiblical. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18, on this rock, I will build my personal pronoun church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want us to understand that uh, the church of Jesus Christ was not founded or headed by the Pope. The church 
of Christ was not fed, uh, founded or headed by Henry VIII. It was not founded or headed by Joe's John Smythe. It was not founded or headed by John Wesley. It was not founded or headed uh, by Joe Osteen. It was not founded and headed by Creflo Dollar. Neither was it founded or headed by T.D. Jake's Potter House. Amen. So we have to understand that the church of Christ, the church that he uh, purchased with his own blood was not founded on any man, but Christ and he alone. And that's what we have to understand. In verse 10 of our text, uh, Paul talks about the term, the fullness of the times. And this particular term refers to a precise point in time when God restores or brings harmony to the whole of creation in heaven and on earth in his son, Jesus the Christ. This term, fullness of the times, is very similar to the time on God's calendar when he sent the son into the world. Listen to your Bible. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5, listen to your Bible. The Bible says, but when, here it come, the fullness of the time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And so God had a particular time in his mind, amen, for the son to come into the world. And likewise, God has a particular specified time in his mind for the reconciling of all things in his son, Jesus the Christ. When we look at verse number 11 of Ephesians chapter number 1, the Bible talks about an inheritance. The inheritance of the believer, I want us to understand, is not so much uh, the reward bestowed upon those who are in Christ, but rather Christ himself. Amen. The phrase we have and obtain an inheritance is rooted in an Old Testament concept which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 8 and 9 uh, where the tribes when you study the uh, amen the uh, uh, the nation of Israel the tribes of Israel all receive we're talking about the promised land the uh, uh, the land uh, of Canaan amen the land of promise amen uh, uh, that was uh, promised to uh, Israel. Uh, they all received allotment except uh, the tribe of Levi. And so each tribe received a land inheritance except the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe. Those who bore the ark of the covenant of God. A amen. They, uh, amen. They were those who stood before the Lord and ministered to him and, and blessed his name. And so because of that, the Lord declared that he himself was their inheritance. And so when we think about inheritance, I, I want us to understand what true value really is. Today, the Christian is a priest. According to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, the Bible lets us know that we are a royal priesthood. And, and so the inheritance uh, of the child of God, the Christian, is encompassed in the giver above the gifts of God. Too often we want God, we want what God provides over who he really is. But when you mature in the faith, it is the person of God that is our prized possession. Amen. You missed your shout. Amen. It's not about what God's going to give us, but it's about being in an intimate relationship with God in eternity forever. To encourage the saints, the Apostle Paul says, amen, in Romans chapter number 8, verse 38 through 39, Paul says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, our love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And, and so we have to come to terms and, and recognize a few things. You see, I can deal with losing my house. A lot of things happen in this life. 
but I can't deal with losing Jesus. I, I can deal with losing my car, but, but don't let me lose the Lord. I can deal with losing my job, but don't let me lose Jehovah. I can deal with losing my savings, but let me not lose my Savior. And God forbid, I can even deal with losing my life, but not my soul, which is hidden in King and Christ Jesus. And so we have to recognize where the true value lies. It lies in our Lord who purchased us through his sinless blood on Calvary's cross. But for those who were never connected to Christ in the first place, they're already separated from King Jesus. And it's important that you understand where you are. You're either in two places. You are either in the population of the saved or the population of the unsaved. Well, today is the day, and now is the hour to accept Christ's payment for your sin and your soul through the obedience of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. In Hebrews chapter number uh, 3 and verse number 15, we learn that today is the day. The uh, Hebrew writer says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of Rebellion. Well, in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1, we learn that now is the hour. For the Apostle Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so salvation requires obedience. If you want to be connected with Christ, you must obey the gospel. I like to think about the gospel, amen, as HBO, not uh, your home box office, uh, amen, uh, channel, but HBO, hearing God's word, believing God's word, and obeying God's word. And so that helps people understand uh, God's plan for uh, salvation. When we look at uh, Romans chapter 10, verse number 16, uh, through 17, uh, listen to your Bible. The Apostle Paul says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, our point here is that the gospel must be obeyed. There is something everybody must do in order to be connected to Christ. In Romans chapter number 16 and verse number 26, uh, the Bible talks about obedience to the faith. And so there is no question that there's something a man has to do. God has done his part, but if you want to be saved on God's terms, there's something every man and every woman must do in order to be saved. In Ephesians chapter number one, verse number 13, one scripture uh, beyond uh, my assigned uh, uh, scriptural text. Verse number 13, listen to Paul. Paul says, in him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so it's important that we understand that biblical belief encompasses one's faith in the gospel of Christ Jesus. Amen. And so we have to understand that the seed is the word of God, according to Luke uh, chapter 8 and verse number 11. The seed is the word. And what God wants, amen, is, uh, amen, for uh, uh, the seed of the word, amen, to be implanted in the heart of our mind to the saving of our soul. If you will, look with me, if you will, at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, I want us to take a look at verse uh, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, uh, listen to your Bible. The Bible says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. This is very important. The gospel is good news. What is the gospel? Romans 1, 16, the Bible lets us know that it is the power of God unto salvation. You need to know something about the gospel if a man is going to be saved. Paul said, moreover, brethren, I declare to you, here it comes, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand by which you also are saved if you, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Listen to your Bible. For I delivered to you, first of all, Paul says, amen, uh, which, uh, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. 
Fact number one. Amen. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Three facts that you need to understand relative to the good news of Jesus Christ. That Christ is Lord and that he hung, bled, and died for your sin and for mine. That he was buried but that he also rose again. And so you have to believe that message. Oftentimes we encompass the, the message of the cross in John 3.16, a very familiar scripture. Uh, amen. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But I want to call your attention to verse number one of 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to your Bible. Moreover, brethren, again, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. I want us to understand that true believers are receivers. That's what I was talking about moments ago when I made reference to Luke chapter 8 and verse number 11. The word of God is the seed and the seed must be implanted in the heart of of your mind. Amen. It must have, uh, amen, good soil in order for that seed to be implanted. Listen uh, to James, James chapter 1 and verse number 21. Listen to James. He says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. And so we have to understand that, uh, amen, that uh, your mind is the soil and the seed is the word and your mind must receive the seed in order for you to do what thus saith the Lord in terms of a believing and obeying. Amen. None of that can take place if you're not willing to hear the word of God. And so we pray that there are those that are with us at this hour, amen, that have soil that's ready to receive the seed of the word to the saving of the soul. When we look over there, amen, uh, amen, when, when Paul stood and testified before uh, King Agrippa, the Bible lets us know Agrippa believed uh, but was not a believer because he did not receive the word. Listen to your Bible, Acts chapter number 26 and verse number 27 and verse number 28, Acts 26 verse 27 and 28. Listen to your Bible. There's a difference, amen, between believing and being a believer, and the difference is receiving the seed of the word. Here it comes. Paul said, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Paul said, I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. The issue wasn't whether Agrippa believed, the issue was whether Agrippa would obey the gospel. And, and so just because somebody hears the word and believes the word does not make them a believer. Why? Because they have not received the seed of the word to the saving of their soul. And so you receive the seed, but now you got to act on the seed in order to be a believer. True believers are receivers. The inception of the church prompted by Peter's preaching of Jesus uh, to those gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost was interrupted, uh, amen, uh, by the question uh, of those that were there to hear that first gospel message. And they said, amen, in Acts 2, 37 and 38, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They heard that Jesus died. They heard that he was buried. They heard that he rose again. They recognized that, that this Jesus had become both Lord and Christ. And based on that, they said, what shall we do? Peter responds, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you drop down to verse number 41 of Acts chapter uh, number 2, the Bible said, then those who gladly, here it come, received his word were baptized. You see, those who are true believers are those who receive the word to the obedience of the gospel, to the saving of this soul. And so we see a pattern uh, of salvation among receivers, which are true believers. We see that they heard the gospel. We see that they believed the gospel. We see that they repented of their sin. We see that they were baptized. But they also confessed Jesus the Christ. You can't become a child of God without confessing Christ. Oh, no, you can't either. When you look over there at John chapter number 12, verse number 42 and 43, John 12, 42 and 43, listen to your Bible. 
Amen. The Bible said, nevertheless, among uh, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Just because you believe doesn't make you a believer. Listen to the distinction. Many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praises of men more than the praise of God. There are many things that are keeping people from acting on what they know they should do in order to become a child of God. For these Pharisees, amen, they loved the praises of the men more than they loved the praises of God. It's not that they did not believe, but they were uh, unwilling to receive the seed of the word to the saving of the soul, to the obedience of the gospel. I want us to understand that confession of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential to salvation. Amen. When we look over there in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 32 and 33, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men... Him I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. In other words, if you, amen, act like you don't know me now, I'm going to act like I don't know you later. But if you confess me now, I confess you later. And so we have to recognize, amen, that confession is absolutely essential. Belief is absolutely essential. Repentance is absolutely essential. Baptism is absolutely essential. But you've got to receive the seed of the word. Because true believers are receivers, amen. When you look at John chapter number one. In John chapter number one, as we haste to a close, John says, but as many as received him. That's what we're trying to get you to do, to receive Christ. Amen. And the only way you can receive Christ is by receiving the word. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. If you believe based on receiving, then you will obey the gospel. And so Jesus says on one occasion, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so we have to recognize and appreciate the fact that Christ purchased man's salvation. He made salvation a possible for every man and every woman. Salvation has come down, but now you've got to reach up. You've got to reach up through the obedience of the gospel, amen, that the precious blood of Jesus Christ might be applied to your soul. And so it's not that salvation is out of reach, it's within reach, but you have to receive the, uh, the implanted word which is able to save your soul, amen, through the obedience of the gospel. God has been too good to us, amen, for us to be Lord of our own lives. Many people want Christ, amen, to save them, but they don't want him to be Lord. Uh, we have to recognize that if you're going to be saved, he has to be Savior, Lord, and Master of your life. And so we want to encourage you, amen, to leave the driving to Jesus. I saw a bumper sticker one time uh, that said, uh, amen, that Jesus is my co-pilot. Well, if that be the case, then you're in the wrong seat. You need to switch seats and let Jesus take the wheel. And if Jesus take you the wheel, takes the wheel, then you'll get to a place called glory because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ purchased man's salvation. Won't you become a child of God through the obedience of the gospel and may God bless you and keep you. My we are grateful for the message that we heard tonight. What a powerful word. And we're so grateful uh, for uh, the awesomeness of the word. And we're so thankful for God for providing us salvation. We need to share this word with our friends. Let them know those who did not have an opportunity to listen to it tonight. And we need to let them know, contact them, communicate with them, let them know they can come on New Testament TV and also Facebook page of our church to hear this powerful message again from this man of God. Let us pray tonight as we prepare to dismiss. God, all of you are grateful. Thank you so much, God, for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for salvation which you brought down. Give us an opportunity, Father, one day to spend eternity with you. Thank you for your answer in a powerful way. And when she stood in the gap, O oh God, and proclaimed your divine truth, may they find an honest heart that will seek you, Father, in regards to the pardoning of their sins. Bless us tonight, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hilltop Church of Christ, 2101 Martin Luther King Boulevard, Northeast, right here in Winter Haven. Your place of refuge, your safe haven, refuge from neglect. 
Here we love God's creation. Refuge from disappointment. Here we encourage God's creation. Refuge from hunger. Here we feed God's creation. Refuge from loneliness. Here we are family. Refuge from the evil one. Here we teach biblical salvation. Hilltop, the congregation of the one church, the body of Christ, where we worship God, putting Him first in all things. We welcome you to come see for yourself. Come enjoy the peace and the love that God has blessed us with. Let us share that peace and that love with you. See you next Lord's Day. Until then, know that Hilltop is here for you.